we're recording. That's a good sign. So do you have like a waiting room somewhere, Aaron, that you can see people trying to get in? Oh, looks like attendees are joining now. Okay. Hello, everyone. I see some participants starting to, to join us. So thank you. There's a, a chat feature. I've, this first slide here shows some of the features available for our communication back and forth. Um, so Rebecca posted hello in chat. Got a Q&A option as well. And Rebecca, under the, the chat, if you're sending one, by the way, there's a toggle between sending to everyone. So if you want. Got it. Hey, Marlon, I thought we'd just wait a few more minutes before we got started. Um, okay. Seeing we've got uh, 17 attendees at the moment, and uh, um, excited to share the information with folks. So. Okay. For those of you who are just joining, uh, this first slide shows some of the features available for uh, for chatting, for submitting questions, uh, or raising a hand if you have a question, comment. So um, we'll start with introductions in just a little bit, and then get into the the meat of the presentation.
Um, I'm going to see if I can make an adjustment to the, uh, the chat. It's not showing up as available to everyone. So. All right. I'm not sure how to troubleshoot the chatting, but we do have the question and answer. I'm seeing some questions come in. So I think if we can use that as our, our tool for people to drop us a line, then we'll uh, we'll make sure to answer those questions as we go. Um, should we go ahead and get started, Marlon? Yes, yes. We'll go ahead and get started. Yeah, please. Uh, we use the Q&A feature uh, in certain <laughs> purpose of the chat for this evening and uh good evening i'm marlon marshall uh midtown redevelopment authority uh i want to thank you all uh for joining us for our final public meeting for the midtown parks and public space master plan uh we're looking forward to hearing your thoughts on the proposed recommendations for our future park and public space improvements here in midtown and um, i see we have some of our uh focus groups and super neighborhood members uh, have joined us so we want to thank all of you who um, participated in our previous surveys focus groups and the previous public meetings uh, related to this plan uh, and we know that there's been a lot of interest around the the recent developments related to the sale of the greyhound bus station property uh, the demolition of the mcdonald's and the potential repurposing of pierce elevated and uh, we're excited as everyone is uh, in the community and as the redevelopment authority, uh, we know that this presents uh, great opportunities to positively impact both existing and future developments in Midtown. And we will continue to work towards facilitating the redevelopment of these areas. Uh, this evening, our focus, however, will be on our investments in parks and public spaces and how we can help to facilitate better de development throughout Midtown. So not only in the area around the Greyhound bus station, and Pierce Elevated, but all the areas in Midtown where we've identified parks and public space deficits. So at this time, I'll turn it over to Rebecca Leonard and Aaron Oatland, uh, who's with our team from Lionheart Places. Great, thank you, Marlon. Uh, I'm Rebecca Leonard, I'm with Lionheart Places. We're landscape architects, urban designers, and planners. Uh, and with me from Lionheart is Aaron Odland, our project manager, and Maitri Fan Salker. Um, <clears throat> also wanted to introduce uh, Ashley Small. She's here as well to help answer any questions we may have. Um, just a little bit about the purpose of tonight's meeting. Uh, we have uh, a draft of the uh, Parks and Public Spaces Master Plan prepared. I'm going to go through a little bit about the process leading up to now. Uh, and also, and then Aaron's going to go through the um, the content of the plan. Uh, we encourage you to add your questions to the Q and A right now. Uh, we will take questions after uh, the presentation. Uh, we'll try to get to all of them tonight. I think there should be plenty of time for that. So what you're seeing on the screen is a draft of the uh, the Parks and Public Spaces Master Plan. 
Uh, earlier in the meeting, Aaron put in the chat to everyone a link to the website uh, that includes this draft. You can follow along there if you'd like. You can dig in and read more detail. We're going to hit some of it in pretty high level tonight. Um, so with that, let's uh, go to the next slide. Um, so we have had a, an advisory committee uh, for this uh, for this document, uh, this planning effort. Uh, you can see the representatives on the advisory committee there on the left. Uh, we tried to be very broad about that, including the super neighborhoods, including uh, various organizations that were uh, active in the realm of parks and public spaces uh, in Midtown. And so we've included them on the, on the advisory committee. We've met with them uh, several times uh, so far. Uh, and really, they've been great about um, uh, providing content for this plan. Next slide, please. Uh, so th the document is organized in four sections uh, right now. Basically, we've got the background, we've got what we call investigate, which is analysis, and then we've got recommendations for streets and recommendations for parks. Uh, eventually, there will be an implementation strategy as well. Once we get feedback on this round of recommendations, we will have a more detailed implementation plan in there. So next slide. Uh, so I'm just going to hit on some of the background. And as I mentioned, Aaron's going to take it away with some of the recommendations after that. So next slide, Aaron. So uh, the Midtown's been diligently planning for many, many years about parks and public spaces and many other things. Uh, but here were some initial studies that we looked at, uh, that, that some of which were written by Midtown, uh, others by the city and, and, um, and other groups uh, in the area. So everything from the 2011 Parks and Open Space Master Plan that this plan will replace, uh, but also the cultural arts master plan, the strategic framework, et cetera. There were also several active um, projects going on. Uh, there was the Safe Streets and Roads for All program, uh, and this document is still in development, but uh, there is a draft presentation of that that was done late in 2022, and so we've been kind of tracking in parallel with that study. Uh, also, other organizations have had studies, like the Museum Park Livable Center study, for example, or the Wike, uh, sorry, Walk um, uh, Bike Montrose study, and several others. So we've really tried to get up to speed on what all of those mean uh, and keep coordinated with those documents and the recommendations that they were making uh, while working on this study. Next slide. Um, I won't go over all the words. Again, this is a document you can download and read at depth, but Really, we're trained, uh, Midtown has really excelled in using parks and public spaces as a way to uh, make the, the uh, district more livable um, and really reinforce the culture and personality of, of Midtown as well through all the park improvements at Midtown and Bagby and, and others, as well as street reconstructions like Bagby Street and, and Caroline Street. Um, really focusing on making this a great place to live, work, and play. Next slide. So these were the goals of the study. Uh, really, we heard early on from the advisory committee and, and the community that uh, Midtown is not just a place to drive through or to, you know, uh, pass through, but it's a destination. It's, they've got lots of uh, uh, restaurants and, and special places that draw people from all over the community in Midtown. Uh, and it's home to a lot of people. And so really making this a, a destination uh, quality uh, public spaces and streets and parks. Uh, thinking about resilience and maintenance, uh, that's been another key factor in some of the uh, recent um, uh, upgrades to, to streets and parks and public spaces is really looking at the durability of the materials, but also looking at ways of being more resilient um, and accommodating the changing uh, dynamics in our environment, like flooding and, 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 uh, and, uh, and that sort of thing. Culture and innovation. Uh, Midtown is known as having a, a really strong culture. And so integrating art and integrating uh, opportunities for that innovative spirit that is um, so uh, uh, essential to Midtown uh, to come through in its public spaces. Uh, health and wellness, uh, really 
identifying as one of the most walkable uh, communities in Houston, uh, but also looking at other areas where we can, you know, activate park spaces, activate public spaces uh, for more fitness and health and wellness. And then equitable access, making sure that parks and public spaces are accessible by transit, by bikes, by pedestrians, uh, uh, that they're meeting all the accessibility standards for people with all levels of ability. Uh, next slide. So the process that we've been going through uh, it follows a, a very um, simple process. First of all, we got our thoughts in order. So the goals were part of this think task. Uh, then we moved into investigate, which is really uh, looking at the current conditions in Midtown around parks and public spaces, as well as benchmarking against other communities, other neighborhoods. Uh, and then we moved in what, what we call the create phase, which is where really where a lot of the recommendations came from. Uh, recommendations for streets, for parks, for public spaces, for gateways and entries into the community. Uh, we're currently in the share phase, which is where we try to document all of those discussions we've had along the way uh, into a document. And you've got uh, the draft document there at your fingers uh, in that link that Aaron put in the chat. Uh, and then we, we always, write plans with the idea that eventually the things in it are built and that we have a chance to really uh, uh, understand if they're meeting the goals. So all the time linking back to the goals of the study um, and as projects are implemented and implemented from this study, they will also be linking back to those goals. So next slide. Uh, just in terms of community outreach, um, we, we had a big strong kickoff meeting with the advisory committee and uh, the Midtown staff. Uh, then we had, um, during the investigate phase, we had what we called a values and vision workshop. Um, and this was a public workshop there in person in Midtown. Um, then we, we've also had several focus group meetings at, at every phase of the project. We've met with um, you know, special districts, super neighborhoods, the advisory committee, uh, agencies that have some sort of a role in parks and public spaces. Uh, as well as the Urban Planning Committee and other committees that, um, that Midtown has. Um, and then here we are at the, uh, the, the next public meeting, which uh, is to really present these findings and the recommendations to you all, get your feedback on that, and then take that forward, finalize the plan, and create a really strong implementation strategy so that Midtown can move forward with these over the next 10 years. Next slide. All right, Aaron, you want to take it away? Great, thanks, Rebecca. So uh, thanks for everyone who's participating. I did in the Q&A put the link to the PDF of this document. So even after this meeting, um, there's also a project page for the Midtown Parks and Public Space Master Plan on the Midtown website. I can put that link in, the, up in there as well at some point in the Q&A. Um, so a couple of ways you can reach out and, and get that if, if you wanna dig into this in a little more detail. I am going to try and go through um, somewhat quickly on some of these slides for the sake of time, so we have a good chunk at the end for questions and answer. Um, this next phase is investigate, so this uh, talks about some of the analysis we went through, and uh, if you attended the first uh, public workshop or were able to participate in one of our focus group meetings before, uh, probably familiar with some of this um, information. So, in terms of our methodology, you know we used a lot of GIS data that we collected looking uh, through the city of Houston and uh, previous Midtown plans. We also went on site to do some field analysis, especially for the park spaces where we were um, specifically interested in um, the program elements within the parks. Uh, there's a shared key indicated here on the right. So these are some colors and lines you're gonna see throughout all these maps that are similar. You'll see the Midtown tours boundary. You'll see a quarter mile radius off there, which is going to show a buffer that's a quarter mile, which is about a five minute walk outside the boundary. Uh, Greenway trails, bayou, and metro rail, the, the red line that goes through. Um, you'll also see some reference to some survey results. After the first meeting, we posted an online survey uh, that people answered. We got about 151 responses, so we've integrated some of those responses into some of these slides as we move forward. Um, this is an overall parks map. So um, you can see in that the, the bold uh, dash line, that's the TERS boundary. The, the yellow offset, that's, uh, that's that quarter mile offset, five minute walk I was talking about. It was important for us to capture that, um, 
because when we were thinking holistically about parks and who has access to parks in Midtown, um, we wanted to think about um, you know areas beyond the boundary because those are potentially park spaces that are available to residents. So the dark green dots here uh, in Midtown, uh, things like number one Bagby Park all the way to plant it forward, those are ones within the tourist boundary, but also the, the lighter yellow green ones you have are outside of the quarter mile of the boundary. And that includes uh, such as number five Emancipation Park over here, which has some unique uh, program elements that you don't find anywhere else uh, in that easy <coughs> access for the district, um, things such as the, the pools that are there and some other courts and things. So um, the typical park as we looked at it, you know, has about uh, three program elements and we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, park ownership was another thing that we looked at. Um, because not all parks are equal in terms of how they are publicly accessible throughout the day or, or who manages it. So the key down here, we show different ownerships. Um, the lighter green is city of Houston. The, the darkest green is Olive is Midtown. Um, the mid green is a school spark park. And then you have um, kind of a, a yellow green is a private park. So, um, Midtown has built and manages several parks, including Midtown Park, right in the center heart of the district. But City of Houston also operates some other ones, such as Baldwin Park. Um, and then Spark Parks, if you're not familiar with those, that's where the it's a citywide program where the school district uh, partners with areas in order to provide access to campus after hours. So there are a couple of those uh, in the Midtown area. So this is a for us is one of the, the key maps we're looking at. It's park proximity, and we'll see some program, similar program maps later. On the, on the left-hand side, you'll see the change of access within a quarter mile walk to parks, people in the district through time. So in 1994, there were two parks, and you see a large dark orange zone where there were not not any parks available in that quarter mile walk distance. Uh, fast forward to 2012, uh, you have eight parks and you see an improvement there. 2017, you've got 10 parks and currently there are 12 parks. So, um, And the reason we use this quarter mile metric um, is because it's a fairly standard one that's used by other groups as well. The Trust for Public Land has a park score system. They use a half mile radius, a 10 minute walk is their baseline metric. Um, previous plans, the 2011 Midtown Parks and Open Space Master Plan used this quarter mile uh, radius. So partially for consistency, but also to be above and beyond uh, even the trust for public land in terms of what they're um, trying to give people access to. Um, you'll see there are some darker orange areas. So those on this map on the right, those indicate the underserved areas. Those are where, and from a GIS buffer of a quarter mile off of these areas, those are spots where there is currently not any park access at all. <coughs> um, these couple of image, uh, maps here, they capture some of the results that we got from that survey I mentioned that was after that first meeting. So we had mapped on the left here, a few indicators about where people had most visited in Midtown. And we definitely saw a correlation between those responses and Parkland. And then we also had uh, a question about perceived safety. And uh, there is a, a correlation between, you know, there's some areas that are underparked in this upper north area um, in particular. Um, that's not necessarily a causation, but it's just something that was, there's coincides that there's a lack of park space and a perceived a lack of safety based on the survey results. Now we get into a little more detail uh, about some of the, the, how you move through the midtown. So we looked at vehicular uses. Um, in general, the, the red streets are your major thoroughfares. The blue ones are major collectors, the, the lighter blue minor collectors. So we were looking at, you know, thinking about how we can make these complete streets. So one step was looking at vehicle movement. Another step was looking at bike lanes. So all of these um, lines on here indicate either existing or planned bike lanes. Um, and we tried to, to match with the, the Houston bike plan as much as possible for this. Um, there's an indicator here between high comfort and low comfort. That's a number of factors, whether it's on street or off street, and also the speed of vehicular travel. 
but you'll see some existing bike lanes you're familiar with now in Midtown, such as the north-south one on, on Austin Street. That's a dedicated on-street bike lane. Um, compared to, uh, there are some share markings on, on the Branch Street, uh, which is an example of a shared on-street parking. In terms of off-street, that would be something like the, the mixed-use trail at Buffalo Bayou or something. So that's where it's literally off the roadway entirely. Uh, we also looked at public transit, again, thinking about how this can be a complete street in terms of you know, transit, um, vehicular movements, bicycles, pedestrians. So there are numerous uh, bike routes, <coughs> sorry, bus routes that go through the district. It's an important bus corridor, a couple of ones that we you know, know are a key importance. You have the red line uh, that goes through down Main Street. There is also a BRT, um, a bus rapid transit route that's proposed on Richmond and Wheeler that would have a stop, um, a station in the Wheeler area. And then uh, several other you know, east-west bus lines uh, that go through as well. Walkable areas. If you're not familiar with this, there is a City of Houston Walkable Places program in Midtown was one of the pilot um, study areas for that. There is a, a distinction here is the purple are primary streets, the blue are secondary streets. So the primary streets require a larger a pedestrian zone if developers are going to um, either redevelop or do new development on land, um, which means a larger pedestrian realm. Um, the blue streets are secondary and those indicate uh, still an improved pedestrian realm, but a, a smaller scope. But this is getting to the point of of how can we make this a better space for people walking and we wanted to make sure we coordinate our thinking with that and our recommendations. Um, this is street connectivity and direction. So this uh, was something we were interested in in terms of where are the one-way streets, where are the two-way streets, where are there dead ends? You'll see on the <coughs> east side along uh, the freeway, there are quite a few streets that just stop. Um, that means there's a, a challenge of connectivity across over to the greater third ward in particular. Um, so that was, a, uh, and there are also a significant number of one-way streets, um, probably all familiar with the one-way couplets, um, north-south, such as, uh, Brazos and, and Bagby, or San Jacinto and Fannin, so those are ones where, uh, when we're looking at our street sections, we were trying to think about the opportunities there, too. And then there's NHH IP cap and stitch in Pierce Elevated, like Marlon had, had brought that up earlier. These are definitely have uh, three sides of Midtown are, are potentially impacted by the decisions that we may be made during these these um, these potential changes to the roadways. So not just the Pierce Elevated at the north, but there are a lot of um, proposed caps and stitches uh, along the the Wheeler Avenue area on the south that could have a great impact to that zone as well. And then I had mentioned all the dead end streets on the the east side. There's opportunities for improved connectivity uh, there as well. Um, and at the bottom left here, I wanted to just highlight there have been a number of proposals in some of these areas. Um, the Pierce Elevated Park and Pierce Sky Park, um, Plan Downtown has ideas for the Greenway there, and the, in, the Midtown NHHFD Vision Plan. That's uh, another document that we had referenced when we we're looking at this. So and finally, um, cultural sites, one of the plans that I think Rebecca had mentioned earlier was the cultural arts master plan that had been developed previously. So the destinations of where people want to go are certainly an important factor in terms of, of making complete streets and destinations and you know, prioritizing routes for people. Um, so now we're going to get into the meat of the create. So we took all that information um, and our strategy was to think about it in terms of uh, hierarchy versus priority. So um, Marlon mentioned this before, but you know, we're, our vision is really to try and create a implementable plan. So this specific um, Midtown Parks and Public Space Master Plan is trying to develop recommendations for capital improvements over the next five to 10 years. So really wanna see things that can be changes that can be done in that uh, near to midterm future. Um, so in order to narrow that down um, to key priority projects, we started with the process of trying to develop a hierarchy for all roadways and all park spaces 
to help us create a ranking system to narrow that down. And once we have that more narrow list, um, we had to think about um, the level of importance. Is it important, not important? And the level of urgency, is it ur not urgent or is it urgent? Um, and think about if it's already been done or not a priority of those things. So what we're really trying to get to point are what are the things that are most important and the most urgent in this upper right that can be accomplished in this, this time frame that we're really targeting of this next five to 10 years. To, to start with that for streets, um, I mentioned we took all a list of all the streets in Midtown. Um, in order to create this hierarchy, we looked at these other plans that we've mentioned before. We looked at the cultural arts master plan, the strategic framework plan, Houston bike plan, the walkable streets, transit streets, the safe street priority um, booklet or presentation that Rebecca mentioned, and tried to find, you know, were these listed as priority streets um, within those documents? And if they were, we assigned them a point. And this helped us to go through this previous information and the decisions that had been made and the thought that had gone into it to try and uh, categorize these streets on a, giving a point system. This next slide uh, shows a summary of that in a map form. So the key down here, you'll see that the thicker the line, the, the higher level that is in terms of those points. That goes from level six to level one. As an example, McGowan got six points when you looked at all those things combined together and the other documents were being indicated as a priority street. <clears throat> so um, this gave us our overall hierarchy of all the streets that we established. In terms of how to narrow that, um, you know, we wanted to think about, you know, when we're narrowing, what are the impacts we can have on streets? So there are three different zones that we were thinking about. You've got the street zone itself, which has a potential for bike lanes or for crosswalk striping, those sort of changes. You have the pedestrian realm, which is your back of curb area. You know, a lot of potential for improvements in the sidewalk, the planting, um, street furnishings and those building transitions, and then also on street parking. Is there a potential for, um, you know, rethinking how the, the on-street parking is being used in terms of bike lane potential and other things? So we, we took those hierarchy of streets and narrowed down the, the priority uh, based on you know, what were the top ranked ones and also um, if there were ones that already had had significant improvements, such as is Bagby Street as an example or, or Caroline. Uh, which had recent improvements through a significant portion in the, the core part of the TERS. Um, then we, for this short list that we're doing now, um, remove those just because we wanted to focus down on somewhere in a, about a top 10 list of streets so we could have a manageable number of things when we're developing an implementation plan and roadmap that can be addressed. So on the left here, you'll see these top 11 priority streets. We couldn't get quite to 10. Um, they're just list, listed in alphabetical order. There's no prioritization based on the name there. Um, and you can see they're dispersed fairly evenly throughout, uh, throughout Midtown. So for each of these, um, we then tried to figure out what were the, the improvements that we could accomplish on them. Um, and we set about doing this um, by trying to come up with a typical uh, cross-section for each of the, the streets that are the proposed priority ones. So I'll just discuss this template here. This is Alabama Street. Uh, this upper section here is the existing section of the street. And we've identified those three zones, uh, the sidewalk zone, the parking zone in this case, there is no parking. And then the, the yellow is the, the street lane zone. The upper left here shows a street key. So you can kind of see, you can see where that priority street is ind indicated. If there is a proposed cap or stitch or other element in an HHIP, we've marked that as well, because um, we think it's important that as we think about how we could improve these streets, that we want to be able to, to make sure they're good connectors over to other districts as well. Um, we also referenced the 2018 Midtown, Midtown Sidewalk Survey. Um, we were looking at sidewalk segments and whether they were in good condition or not, is that was another factor and, and whether uh, we felt like improvements were needed in that area. On the, the bottom here, the bottom right, 
this is the recommended street conditions. And again, this is uh, it's a, a typical section. We know the streets will change as you go down the corridor horizontally. So any sort of planning effort that would go into the streetscape itself would need to be mindful that now not one section is not going to apply everywhere. But the types of improvements on Alabama and uh, that we were looking at, number one, you'll see convert two travel lanes into an off street dedicated six foot bike lane on either sides with signs and safety for cyclists. So this was um, taken inspiration from previous um, planning efforts we'd seen on Alabama street. And this area, the roadway is also indicated in the Houston bike plan. So we saw that as a potential opportunity um, to re reuse how the traffic lanes are being divided in terms of user groups to make it a higher priority for cyclists. Um, we also proposed number two here, um, maintain travel lanes at a 10 foot width. Um, so we're, it's variable sometimes that we know that for some transit corridors, 11 width is preferred, but we're trying to look at opportunities to, to narrow the, the vehicular part of the lanes in order to give more space for pedestrians and bicycles. Uh, number three item here, you'll see utility lines clean up, and that could take the form of a number of things of either uh, removing unneeded poles um, is a more economical way. And some projects, there could be an opportunity if there's a complete rebuild to even uh, bury some utility lines, but it definitely is a more expensive option. Um, number four, getting into the back of curb zone. Uh, we're looking at uh, widening the sidewalk to a minimum of six feet. Um, we wanna make sure that we're trying to meet that walkable streets uh, requirements in terms of the minimum uh, sidewalk areas um, and also improving sidewalk quality. On this street in particular, there were a number of segments that had been indicated in that survey that needed improvements. Um, also increasing with the planting zones um, is number seven here. Number eight, adding Midtown standard street lights at 20 to 30 foot interval evenly between street trees. That's something you'll see repeat on a lot of these streets. We wanna make sure um, that's something we've heard from many groups about uh, importance of safety and lighting and having consistent lighting for both vehicles and pedestrians. And then uh, number nine, I already mentioned, um, this is just showing the, the buffer between the bike lane and the travel lane. Okay. So I'll go through a little more quickly on this one. I don't wanna take all our, too much time, but now we've got kind of the, the format. You've got top corner is your existing section. Bottom is your proposed, the street key on the left here. Um, this is Brazos Street. It's another street that has some, some previous planning efforts. Um, this is another opportunity we think uh, for a potential road diet um, with some of the street parking to add uh, bicycle facilities here. It could be a uh, 10 foot two way dedicated bike lane. Um, that's something that we think as you get into the, the, the actual design and planning process of the specific street corridor, um, you would get need to get in more detail what makes the most sense for the most stretches of the street. Um, number two, improve uh, crosswalk striping. Uh, the east-west connections can be challenging, some of these one-way couplets in particular. Um, so we wanna make sure the pedestrian experience is as good as possible. Um, number three is another uh, opportunity for utility line cleanup. Number four, adding shade tree and native adapted vegetation in the planting zone. You can see these new ghosted trees in here. Um, we wanna make sure that we have where possible as much planting zone and add street trees where possible to give shade because it's really important for the pedestrian experience, uh, especially in the heat of summer. Um, number six, widen the sidewalk. And number seven, um, I already mentioned adding the bike lane, but that would come at the ex expense of removing one on-lane uh, street parking area. Uh, this third street here is Crawford. Uh, you can see the key map here. On the right side, another one that has a, a potential cap or stitch across it. Uh, the upper shows the existing condition here. Um, this is another street where um, we see a potential for at least a portion of it to be converted, perhaps to Baldwin Park to connect bike routes. I think um, it's, it's something where it's not in the Houston bike plan in this route in particular. Um, we 
do think there is another potential here. You'll see that the travel arrows that Crawford could become a, a two-way street. Um, it is a one-way street for a portion of, of its, when it comes into the district, but it doesn't continue on all the way, that way um, through Main Street. Um, we would want to maintain the, the bus route lanes here at 11 feet to make sure the buses can operate safely. Um, another example of potential utility line cleanup, back of curb. Um, it's another area where we want to look at it, you know, improving sidewalk quality and expanding bike lanes, but also um, try and preserve the health of existing live oaks and other trees along there as well as possible. Number eight, you'll see the street lamps. Uh, number nine, uh, again, bike buffer there. Um, Elgin Street, you get into an east-west. It's a minor collector. Um, the top is in existing condition. The bottom is a proposed condition. Um, there's an existing turning lane there. And it, Elgin's a little bit of a, a challenge in terms of not having much back of curb right of way right now. So without having the ability to impact that, we were trying to see what might be the biggest impacts we could have on the streetscape character. Um, here we saw number three as an opportunity to use portions of that turn lane as a central median. They could potentially be planted with some shade trees as well. Um, and looking where possible to, to narrow lanes to be the most compact in order to give the most amount of green space possible. Um, Back of curb, it is tighter in the right of way, in this specific section, but where it's feasible, encouraging development to encouraging improvements to have that expanded six foot sidewalk. Uh, moving on to Fannin Street. Um, Fannin Street is one where there is, we think, another potential for um, converting a dedicated lane to a two way street on here. Um, that's something that's been explored in other plans that we've seen. Um, there's some interest in in that and the relationship to between safety. Um, they are a lot of pedestrian um, and vehicle um, conflicts that are happening on Fannin and San Jacinto and a couple other streets. So um, trying to see what methods we have to to address that through some design ideas. Um, again, widening back of sidewalk curbs. This is another spot where we could see a potential for adding a dedicated bike lane. Um, that's something the safe street study that they were proposing, um, adding a buffer there. So it's sort of a, a road diet in this situation to, again, make it a more multi multimodal street that's, that's better for pedestrians, cyclists, as well as, as vehicles. Um, Gray Street, you can see up here, uh, just close to Pierce Elevated, Gray Street. Um, there's an existing two-way dedicated bike lane there, um, which has the sort of concrete armadillos right now and provides a relatively safe bike route. The biggest opportunity we saw along here was um, to capture some additional sidewalk width on the north side to create a really robust planting zone and a, a wider sidewalk corridor. So you'll see the number uh, five, six, and three here. We've expanded, proposing expanding the sidewalk to a minimum of eight feet and having a, a minimum six foot planting zone that would really give you an opportunity to have street trees and make this a, a more robust pedestrian corridor. And there might be even be a potential for incorporating some, some linear park pro program along here, like has been done on, on some other successful cultural trails in the US. Um, because we're really wanting to, to think about the streets as, as public space in general. And, you know, aside from just our typical amenities of, of trees and benches and things, are there other park elements we could start to, to bring into there? Um, Main Street, you're going down the middle. There is a, the big move here is um, something that has been proposed in the strategic plan previously, a conversion of Main Street or at least segments of it to um, bike and pedestrian only, as well as the transit, but removing the travel lanes for vehicles right now. So currently you have the two lanes, one north and one south, 
for bike lanes or for the vehicle lanes, those would be converted into bike and pedestrian lanes. Um, similar to some other streets, there is some challenge in the back of curb here in terms of trying to expand sidewalk width. But if there were improvements encouraging as generous of a sidewalk as, as feasible, there are some really nice tree, existing trees along this roadway as well, which makes a challenge. Uh, this is looking at the entry under Pierce Elevated into Main Street. Um, we feel like in particular for a prominent street like this, that really is one of the main routes that people come through the district, especially on the, the red line, that there's some, some opportunities for branding wayfinding and, and, and passage, such as painting the uh, number three here, we've got uh, wayfinding. So this says this way to Midtown Park. So are there opportunities to, to drive people towards the, the parks and public spaces in the district? Or number two in the, the median here, is there an art potential for art opportunities or graphics and murals as you as you enter into the district on this, this uh, major corridor? And then some, some lower impact items like uh, number seven, in improving the accessible route uh, striping and uh, restoring crosswalk zones and those sort of items. Um, McGowan Street is the next one, um, another east-west one. And this is another one where the, the main move is introducing some, some proposed bike lanes. This is another street that's part of the Houston bike plan. So you would maintain two 11-foot travel lanes. It'd still be two-way, but potentially have a dedicated bike, bike lane in each direction on each side. Um, we're also some similar items in terms of widening the sidewalk. Uh, this one has some, some sidewalk segments that could use some improvements to improve those segments and then make sure we're adding, uh, lighting throughout. And San Jacinto, it's a, it's, as I mentioned before, um, another one that has had some some concerns about traffic and pedestrian safety. So look at an opportunity here to narrow the street down, another potential two-way conversion of travel in two directions. Um, that's definitely something we need to be study more as you we work in the master planning and, and documentation of the specific street corridor. Um, if we were to get that extra space, there's some potential we think to expand um, the back of curb planting areas. Uh, perhaps there's a potential on the street to implement rain gardens, like was successfully done on Bagby Street, or more recently on Caroline. Um, but we had wanted to think about how could we keep that green infrastructure uh, success going on, on other streets. And the last of the 11 streets, this is Webster Street. So the existing condition here on the top, um, on the bottom here, you'll see that we're looking to improve the back of curb area in particular by giving some, some more robust planting zones, uh, adding more street trees, trees adding more lighting. Um, so those are the, the main implement, implementation ideas or, or more back of curb in those areas. Oh, there's a Wheeler, I'm sorry. Uh, one last street. Um, so Wheeler, this is the, I mentioned previously, the bus rapid transit route that was being proposed. So the top is the existing section was, is very tight in particular. Um, there's not much back of curb area right now. There's no, in this section, there's no planting zone or street tree zone. On the bottom here, we're showing what is being proposed in the, the current BRT plans, where you have two bus lanes traveling down the center and a travel lane on either side. Um, we think that in order to have the type of street section with a six foot walk and a minimum six foot planting zone with street trees, that's what would really make this, we think uh, the best road section possible, but that would require additional right of way. So this is one, the one example I think where we were thinking beyond that boundary, just because of the constraints from having the, the transit route in the middle doesn't leave you much room to do much back of curb improvement unless you explore the opportunity of doing that. All right, that was a lot to to go through, and thank you for your patience and and going through it all. I um I'm going to move on to the parks now. 
Again, the, the document, I posted the link for that. So if you want to browse through in more detail about the recommendations for those typical street sections for those 11 streets, um, uh, we encourage you to do so. So next, we're going to get into the park areas. So this is um, much like with the streets, we started with this idea of creating a hierarchy, taking all the parks and trying to think about them holistically. Um, the columns we have here indicate if it's inside or outside the boundary, the number of program elements in it. So that means like, is that for water feature? Does it have a, a green lawn? And we'll have a chart of that in just a minute that shows you more detail on that. The ownership, the park type, and this is in terms of based on the scale of it, generally uh, parks less than one acre are considered pocket parks. Uh, over one acre to 14 acres is uh, usually considered to be uh, a neighborhood park. Um, and then greater than that, you have a, a larger scale um, you know, community park that serves a, a wider demographic. So Emancipation Park and Midtown Park are a little unusual. We're calling them urban, par urban parks because they're, they're smaller than your, your 14 acre park that would have a similar amount of program. And it's something that we see in the planning world where um, you're finding more dense program in these, these smaller areas to serve the needs of the community. Um, so the parks hierarchy here ended up being based uh, mainly on the, the program elements within the park because we, when we were looking at parks, we saw there are two issues. One is there's a, a deficit of any access to parks. So uh, you'll see the areas in black here, those match the earlier map we sh showed that sort of there's no access to any parks in that quarter mile zone. But these shades of blue, they indicate the quantity of programs. So the darker the color is, the, the less amount of programs you have available within the space. And the lighter, the more programs you have. So we noticed two things in this. One, that there you know, is a complete lack of parks, but also there's a lack of program because we want to make sure, or Midtown wants to make sure that not only do people have access to, to a park, but that there's a diverse amount of things they can do at the parks and that people throughout the district have access to a diverse amount of things to do in those parks. So I mentioned the different program elements on the right here. These are the, the different program items that we are tracking throughout every single park. So I had mentioned that we had done some, some field study of looking at these. So we went to every single one of these parks and um, you know, looked at, at all of these 10 items to see if they were present on there. They include lawn space, jogging trails, water features, dog parks, community gardens, performance space, active recreation, shelter pavilion, playground, and community halls. So, um, so generally speaking, on average, there were three programs per park. You can see a park like we capture the edge of Herman Park. Herman Park has one of everything there. But Midtown Park, which is much smaller, also has a significant amount of these program elements. Um, by contrast, something like um, Manil Park, which is the Manil campus, it's pretty much just has a lawn and open space area. And there's several of those where uh, we saw that there was this lack of program. So from that, um, this is the equivalent of that priority street map we saw earlier, which took those overall hierarchy and narrowed it down to those 11 streets. In this case, we wanted to identify what are the, the main deficit areas so we identified six main park deficit areas. So these are areas that have no parks or they have a lack of, of equitable access to different program elements within parks. Um, the light blue areas, those areas that uh, we did not identify as a park deficit. So that was our approach. And then I mentioned you know, a park deficit F, Manila Park over here. So we're gonna go through each of those. This first one, it's a similar format here to the streets in terms of you have this key plan on the left that shows you the area within the context of the district. And our question yeah, was within these areas, what are some creative ways that we could address that, um, that lack of, of either program or lack of park access whatsoever? And so there are potential long-term opportunities. Um, Marlon had mentioned about Pierce Elevated and there are several plans, <laughs> excuse me, about how that might be used. Many of them 
including park space, whether that is elevated or on the ground plane. But the, that we see that as long term potential that yes, that land has has potential value for that. But in the shorter term, in this sort of five to 10 year span, we're also interested in what are other opportunities. So um, when we were looking at Gray Street number two here, I'd mentioned the opportunity for um, potentially adding some program elements and we'll show a vision of what that may be in the next slide. And then number three, we noted areas that were parking lots or undeveloped um, as spaces where Midtown could um, partner with a, a private development to include a publicly accessible um, private park space. That's something that has been accomplished elsewhere. So we weren't just looking for one solution to the deficit, but trying to, to think of different solutions for different time frames or different ways to address them. This is along Gray Street. Um, so this is a stretch where if we had that expanded um, back of curb zone, we were trying to think about some creative ways one might, might program this. Um, the existing condition here, there are no park elements. Um, and the diagram, the vision, I'm calling the vision diagrams on the right here. Um, we thought you could use um, how, and the, the bottom left here shows your current program elements in the bottom right. And to the side of that shows, you know, adding the program elements. So community garden, could you use that planting strip to, to create a butterfly gardener or some type of other native garden that would have some habitat value, but also be a, a general asset to the community? Um, active recreation, there's a concept of skate dots with uh, smaller scale skate parks. So is that something that could be applied in a linear format? and some portion of this backup curb area. And then uh, a jogging slash walking trail. So is there potential here, uh, as shown in this example of the Indianapolis Cultural Trail in Indianapolis and in Indiana, and really creating a, this really great um, back of curb pedestrian experience that makes that a jogging and walking trail. Uh, moving on to part deficit area B. Um, there's some similar ideas here um, in terms of the number three item. A lot of these areas have some underutilized vacant or parking lot space that maybe in the long term has some potential for development as open space um, in a public private partnership or some other fashion. Um, there's a portion of streetscape here on, on Webster, you know, or Gray could be potentially developed in that linear street park fashion I discussed. Um, and we also, there was one park that had been identified in our plan, it's, it's private park, Chenevert uh, Urban Gardens, and that's a space that we zoom in on. On the left here, you can see the existing um, garden plots. Um, you can see that's the only current program element from our list of 10 that's there. So in this vision diagram, we thought about how could you add some play ground element, some water feature, and a shelter pavilion to uh, make it a, a broader asset for the community. So um, the yellow spaces here are potentially the shelter pavilion, as shown in the example in this uh, Viaduct Rail Park in Philadelphia. In terms of water features, maybe there's a, a synergistic way to have some stock tank elements as part of the garden. There's an example here shown at Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center in Austin. And then in terms of a playground, we thought about it, you know, could there be a nature play opportunity? Um, to, to bring more family and more kids in this space. And these aren't intended to be prescriptive of exactly this is what have to happen, but uh, it's, uh, I think, something that is trying to spark ideas of how there might be a, a public-private partnership in a space like this to help uh, meet this, this program deficit within this area. Uh, moving on to park deficit C. Um, this is located in the western part of Midtown adjacent to Spur 527. Um, there are no parks in this area. Um, there is one parcel in particular we thought was an interesting opportunity. It was the Lulac Council 16 building. There's a community hall there with historic significance that uh, Midtown has supported in the past and has been, there's a nonprofit that's working to, to re uh, refurbish that. Um, we also thought that there's an existing entry portal at Holman Street and Louisiana Street. Um, it's, it's public land that's currently uh, maintained by Midtown. So spaces like that, we're trying to think about ways that those could 
maybe be repurposed and add more park space elements to them. And then also, as we mentioned, you know, that the same idea of, of how can you convert a street into be more of a, a public space in general. Um, this is the entry portal uh, at Louisiana and Holman Street. So this is an existing aerial right now. There is no programming currently. There is a, uh, there are some signs there welcoming into Midtown and some plantings. Um, but we were trying to think, you know, with a space this size, what were some destination features that could be introduced? Um, we're proposing, you know, is a vision. There could be a, some shelter, a dog park, and some active adult recreation. Um, dog parks are something that are popular throughout the district. There's a large multifamily building across the street from here. So spatially, we thought it could be something that could be a draw for people or something similar like that. But we thought it was important, whatever might be improved here, that it would draw people into the space. Um, shade and shelter is something we think is always great for, for park spaces and in our central Texas heat or in Houston heat. And uh, in terms of active recreation, um, you know, there's already some bike routes along here, so maybe some adult fitness equipment. The second parcel I mentioned was that Lulac Council 60 building. Again, no existing programming there, but maybe there's an opportunity to really create a great outdoor space to complement this uh, revitalized community center. So again, add in some shade, maybe some of the greenness, some open lawn space, and uh, potentially adding the community garden into this as well. And again, and not so important, you know, the specifics of this has to be done, but is there an opportunity for this relationship? And there's an opportunity to enhance programming, whether it's this program elements or some other program. Um, this is deficit area D. Um, so some similar ideas here in terms of um, utilizing undeveloped and vacant lands. We do also think that through this area, there are some, some museums, um, which are a you know, big asset along a, a large stretch of, of Midtown and going, especially a part of the tours that heads down into the museum uh, district area. Um, also, HCC is a big um, big asset in this area. And they have their San Jacinto Memorial Green, which is a, a very large open space. And this is one where we were just imagining from that existing program here on the left, you see all that's there is the open lawn space. And you can see that in the existing aerial. <laughs> but is there some potential to enhance this area and, and make it more active for the community as a whole? So this is a, another spot where we're recommending, you know, could there be a, a prairie garden as a community garden in this space? <clears throat> is there an opportunity for a shelter and pavilion here? Uh, as we showed an example in the lower right. Uh, again, this would be another example of, of that sort of, of partnership that we have to develop, but just trying to see how we can utilize the existing space and, and uh, make it even better for everyone. Uh, moving on to area E, uh, this is a uh, southern area of, of Midtown, so this will be a spot that has potential to see long-term transformation uh, from the potential cap and stitch. Uh, we're showing this the Wheeler area here that is a potential cap area. There's also the bus rapid transit route that goes through here is the dashed red line. So there's a lot that's going to be going on here, an ion development that's been happening here. Um, so there are many opportunities of what could happen in the long term. Um, in the short term, an area we want to focus on that could be another sort of partnership experience is the existing Peggy's Point Sport Park. It's a little unusual in terms of its its scale. It's 1.5 acres, um, which is pretty big uh, for an open space in Midtown. And it gives you more opportunity, we think, to have more active recreation, which is something when we looked at the he uh, Houston Park's overall master plan, this sector in particular was shown to be lacking uh, in soccer fields and some other active recreation. So that looking at that HBARD master plan definitely guide us in, in the type of program that we show in this vision diagram. Existing, there is a, a, uh, a softball field there, but we thought you could add a you know, jogging and walking trail throughout the perimeter, still have some open lawn space, and maybe act some active recreation. Um, so we're showing here <clears throat> a flexible uh, open soccer lawn, and then there's maybe still some room for a court, a flexible court facility as well. And with the shelter and pavilion, is there an opportunity to create uh, more of a yeah, food truck experience with some picnic tables or 
really invite more of the community into this space. Um, finally, Park Deficit F. This is um, satellite area over by the Manil campus. So um, the number one item here, we you know, saw opportunities to improve Manil Park, the you know, plant it forward zone, or the work with Manil Foundation for more park spacing programming. And there's some underutilized or undeveloped land in this area. So another one of these potential partner opportunities in the future. Um, this is somewhat similar to the Chenevert uh, Urban Gardens in terms of this is another uh, existing community garden that we see the potential to add some more program elements to. Um, and in a similar fashion, you know, we're starting this baseline of the community garden, but could we add some more play element to it? Um, maybe a large nature play in the middle, and then also some shelter and pavilion, uh, just to try and energize the space. Uh, and try and give access to more program elements. So um, that's all of those are, are all seven or all six of the park deficit areas, and then all eleven of the priority street areas that we have thus far provided recommendations on. Um, I think at this point uh, we are hoping to open up to a question and answer session and be able to to go back and uh, answer any questions we can. I, uh, again, encourage you, if you want to dig into this more detail, to, you can go to the project page on the Midtown website or access the, uh, the PDF. I put a direct link in the Q&A session if people want to access that. Rebecca, do you have anything to add? We well, I was just going to say, I've been trying to keep up on the, the Q&A uh, okay. that people have been typing in. Um, but if anybody has a question that they'd like to ask now, I think the process would be you'd raise your hand and then Aaron will have to unmute you, I think. You can also continue to ask questions in the Q&A. Um, uh, so how do we give input into this draft plan? Excellent question. We are going to put into the chat for everyone. Uh, let's put Aaron's email address in there. Uh, you can send direct comments to Aaron and we will get those factored into the plan. So Aaron, um, since you have the capability of putting that in the chat for everybody, could you put that there? Great. Um, then uh, we have, um, in particular, let's see, between Bagby and Brazos, then McGowan and Gray, managing vehicular traffic through this area would be most helpful, reducing traffic lanes, more walkable, managing the traffic flow down Smith and Louisiana. So um, good news is we have uh, been in coordination with the city and they have uh, agreed that some of these um, one-way streets that are uh, really big and, and handling lots of volume, uh, that there is opportunities to make improvements for pedestrians at key intersections. Uh, so we are, we've laid that out in this plan um, and uh, would hope to continue to work with the city to get those things implemented. So uh, Aaron, anything to add to that about some of these, you know, um, traffic flows, high traffic volume streets? No, I'd say we, you know, we were trying to take our cues from other planning and, and thinking efforts. So, because I th think all of those will take consensus building and working with the city and public works department and other things through time. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, you know, there's, it does seem like there's a consensus, there are some safety concerns and that there's some, some great opportunity by making these more complete streets and, and making them more amenable to pedestrians and not just cars that we we can address some of those concerns. Great. And then um, somebody raised a great idea adjacent to the Peggy Point Park. There's a fairly large triangle of grass uh, separated um, by a uh, wide right turn lane. So maybe look at that. There could be an opportunity to reimagine this area and remove the turn lane and, presu and presumably, you know, include more into this park space. So we'll take a close look at that. Um, um, 
another question about uh, any updates on what's happening with the Pierce Elevated. Um, we are um, tracking that project uh, extensively um, and, um, and you know, see a lot of potential for um, uh, looking at it as, as an opportunity to help fill some of our park deficit in that area of Midtown. Um, we don't have, I think, any more information than you have at this moment uh, on that. Um, one thing we ha that has become very clear recently is that the timeline for change, uh, regardless of what that change is for the Pierce Elevated, will be a long time out past the horizon of this planning document. So we've been really focused on things that we can do in the meanwhile, uh, between today and the day that some, some change might happen with the Pierce Elevated. So. And Rebecca, I'll add to that. Um, yeah, we 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 have been, um, you know, working with uh, our partners at Central Houston in their efforts to understand potential civic civic opportunities around the uh, North Houston Highway Improvement Project, and there has been um, discussions around uh, potential alternative uses of the Pierce Elevated, uh, but. As Rebecca mentioned, uh, this effort uh, specifically was more of a uh, how could we have a short term or medium term impact and knowing that um, this segment of the North Houston Highway Improvement Project will be the final segment um, that Pierce Elevated uh, structure will remain intact for well over uh, at least another 10 years. So. Uh, this, this is a project that Chris elevated that is larger uh, than what Midtown Redevelopment Authority alone uh, can take on. It's gonna take a huge collaborative effort between um, governmental organizations, TxDOT, the city, uh, neighboring stakeholders uh, uh, as well. And so as we continue uh, to look at the possibilities of what could happen with Pierce Elevated, we're also looking at um, more shorter, ter shorter term and uh, medium term opportunities to influence the development in that area. But we are uh, working with our partners, uh, governmental organizations and uh, neighboring stakeholders to understand the possibilities around the Pierce Elevator. Great. Um, then somebody mentioned, um, uh, the blocks downtown on Main Street that are no car zones and, and liking those. And yes, we have looked at um, that. Um, um, we have looked at those as benchmarks, but uh, someone else asked a question of other uh, streets that are also closed to cars and how successful were they at maintaining, you know, some vitality and vibrancy and uh, there are some examples of streets that are closed to cars. Um, the uh, 16th Street Mall in Denver is one that just has transit, peds, and bicycles uh, down it, and it is also a retail environment there. But there have been many streets that are closed for periods of time, um, like uh, the uh, I mentioned in the chat to this person, the JFK Drive in San Francisco. Uh, it was closed down a period periods um, of time. And then after COVID, there's been a real movement to close it down permanently to cars uh, because it's been such a successful environment um, for pets and bikes. Um, others in that category of kind of temporarily closing them for different events or different days of the week is Griffith Park Drive in Los Angeles, 38th Ave 34th Avenue in Queens is another great example of that too. So just a, a few to keep in mind and we'll keep looking for great uh, inspiration for those. If you have any more, uh, let us know. Uh, Jason mentions some empty land on Alabama and Alameda across from the Axelrod. Uh, we'll take a look at that, thinking that might be a great place for a park. Um, um, so we will take a look at that as an opportunity there. Um, let's see. Um, that one's one about closing vehicular traffic. We have not identified which sections. I think a much more thorough, uh, we have to go from a planning document to a much more detailed feasibility study to identify which parts of Main Street would be appropriate for closing, uh, because not all of them would. Some, some businesses and things get 
you know, loading and unloading off of Main Street, mm. uh, valet and other parking uh, situations happen near uh, and drop offs happen near Main Street. So we would have to look at basically block by block and really understand how each business works and what kind of impact uh, closing a particular segment of Main Street would be. Uh, but um, that is uh, an idea that's had some traction since the last strategic plan update. And again, with COVID, I think people have realized the value of having some uh, dedicated outdoor space for bikes and pedestrians. So um, um, there was a question about Bagby from 45 to Elgin is a no car zone. Uh, we did not consider that, uh, you know, Bagby just recently had um, some streetscape improvements. And so uh, Bagby did not rise to the top in terms of priority for this um, study. Um, but uh, maybe in the future, that could be an idea to revisit. So um, uh, what's the process of working with the private spaces identified as potential sites for adding park spaces? Uh, I think that that's a really great question that we're going to try to uh, describe in the implementation chapter of this document. Um, but I would say if you are a private entity with land in Midtown that you think would be a good spot for some public uh, recreational amenities, uh, reaching out to, to, to Midtown would be step number one, I would think. Um, so if you have some specifics about that, um, I would recommend reaching out to, to Marlin and seeing if there's any opportunities there. And there are, there is a potential for shared use agreements. That's something that is not uncommon mm -hmm. with public and private uh, partnerships. Uh, you have a, an agreement that just clearly defines what those constraints are. But Great. Somebody mentioned Mulberry Street in New York City in Little Italy closing down and filling up with sidewalk the cafes and, and restaurants and everything flowing out into a great example there. Um, any developments in Midtown mixed use residential or other that are particularly excited about? Um, no one yeah. particular? Uh, Marlon, do you want to mention anything about that? Yeah, I mean, specifically, you know, we're, we're all excited about the potential of uh, the Ion District, uh, Rice's Innovation District, and the old Sears site. I know they're working uh, to bring in developers to develop the remaining parcels there. And so uh, it's going to have a huge impact on the community. So we're particularly excited about that. And uh, obviously um, interested to see uh, the direction of uh, the Greyhound site as well, as everyone is. Great. Um, anybody have any other questions or comments? I think we've got the chat functioning now. Thank you, Aaron, for ironing that out. We're still taking questions on the Q&A. You can raise your hand and, and ask a question if you'd like. All right. Well, you've all been dedicated public, uh, publicly engaged citizens tonight. We appreciate your time. Uh, Aaron put his email address in the chat here. Uh, we would love to hear from you if you have additional thoughts. Um, from a timeline standpoint, we've got, like I say, to write this implementation chapter, which has more detailed steps about, uh, you know, uh, for implementation. Um, and we will expect to be presenting this to the board probably at the end of March or end of April. Uh, and we will keep you all posted. If you replied to this meeting, we'll try to keep your email addresses and get some word out to you that way too. Okay. All right. Thanks y'all uh, for coming out tonight. Have a good evening. Yeah, thanks everyone Thank for participating. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.